Good morning, everyone. This is Darius Dell here, your skipper, to welcome you to another episode of 42 Macro Bundle Live. I have the great pleasure of being joined by Brent Kachuba, CEO and founder of Spot Gamma. How are you doing today, Brent? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Darius. No, it's a real pleasure, man. You're out there, uh, you and Imran Lako of Options Insight, you guys are out there sort of, in my opinion, uh, really cornering the market in terms of uh, helping investors understand a lot of these very critical options market dynamics. So, so if you can sort of Walk us through your background, introduce yourself, introduce Spot Gamma, and we can take it from there. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, so again, my name is Brent Kachuba. I'm a, a founder of Spot Gamma, and what we do is essentially analyze the options market positioning to determine how hedging flows uh, could impact stock and equity indices. Uh, I've spent about 20 years in derivatives. I worked for Bank of America, Credit Suisse, Wolverine. I spent a little bit of time with a family office where I was designing some option strategies. And the basis for those option strategies uh, or essentially the models that we use to uh, look at the markets now with spot cameras uh, data, basically. Yeah, so our bread and butter is we write a daily commentary on the option position in the S&P and the NASDAQ that comes out every morning. And with that, we produce key levels for the market. So where do we see support resistance, basically? How much volatility do we think is uh, going to come into the markets generally on a pretty short-term basis say one to five days and then the other key thing is our ability to sort of analyze how flows are positioned and how those flows are changing so where are put options coming in where are calls coming in and how might that affect uh or how might how might markets be affected by that yeah absolutely that's super helpful so let's uh, unpack some of the stuff you've been talking about now obviously opex has become kind of this big tail wagging the dog, if you will, uh, on Wall Street and in and, and a lot of investors' portfolios. And obviously we're facing up, uh, we're coming up against a, a OPEX this Friday. So we'd love to get your thoughts on kind of, you know, what you're seeing from an, uh, underneath the hood surface and ultimately how to risk manage that. Yeah, absolutely. So I put together a couple slides here just to touch on some of this. And what I think is interesting here, as you mentioned, is there's a big expiration for single stocks coming up on Friday. So we've been watching how the flows are changing there. And uh, as you mentioned, we see that the uh, positioning in options, and I just want to talk through this quickly at a little bit of a higher level, and then I'll build into why we think OPEX, especially this prize OPEX, could be interesting. So essentially what we do is we look at exactly how options flows influence stocks. So most people here are probably familiar with the gamma squeeze concept, particularly after this last year. Uh, but these option flows, particularly in the S&P 500, have been around for, for a long time, right? And options expiration has been something that we've marked as impacting markets. Uh, for quite a while. So most of you are probably familiar with these key terms, you know, Delta, Gamma, Charm, you know, a lot of these kind of buzzwords, right? And all of those terms essentially are ways to describe the flows that we see that are tied to options. And those are the hedging flows that are tied to options. And so in this case, what's so important is when we have an options expiration with very big options expirations, uh, excuse me, very big options positions expiring, the hedging flows around those options positions should change. And it's those change in hedging flows, which we think can impact the market. So whether you're looking at Delta, Gamma, Vanna, Charm, all those buzzwords, all that we're trying to do is describe how hedging flows are going to change and how that might might impact uh, both single stocks as well as, as the indices. So just to give a quick high level of what you of what you mentioned here, um, the most two most famous options explorations I always talk about in, in recent times are the December uh, of 2018 quarterly options expiration. So the quarterly expirations are the biggest options expirations in terms of notional size. If you look at how much uh, open interest and then the Delta tied to that open interest. So, so Delta is how we sort of measure the, uh, the, the value of uh, what is expiring. And so if you remember the markets in December of 2018, this is a major macro event, right? And you can speak to this probably better than I can, but we had uh, Mnuchin, you know, calling the banks right on Christmas Eve day, and there was all sorts of rate issues. And again, I'm not going to attempt to wade into that. You're much more uh, uh, sophisticated in your analysis of that. But it's fascinating to me that that Monday was a short holiday. That was the day after options expiration in which hundreds of thousands of put options expired in the S&P 500. That mm -hmm. was the low of the market and the day after we ripped. Right. And you can see that it's a small chart here. I apologize. But if you just look this up. We absolutely ripped after that. So there was a nosedive into that. It coincided with all of these headlines, right? Um, but I would argue that the options positioning 
because there are such big put options tied to this date, right, the third Friday of December, that exacerbated the volatility there. And then once those put options are wiped out, hedging flows clean up, we don't need to short uh, futures anymore to hedge out these put options and the market can just rip, right? Shorts get covered basically is what that is. The other famous one, March of 2000, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Darius. Just real quick question, is, is, uh, is the, does the size of the put option exposure, the Delta exposure, uh, into the current decline and make it have a big difference in terms of the, the, the size of the decline? I think, I think it's, I think it absolutely does. I mean, yeah. what, what the issue is, is, and, and let's just talk about the March, for example. So if you think about the March, 2020, uh, expiration, you can look this up that there was big headlines at the end of 2019 about Bridgewater in particular, buying massive March put options. I think they owned like a hundred thousand put options and Ray Dalio had to go out there and be like, no, 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 we're not bearish on the market. You know, we're just buying a bunch of puts, right? Those big institutional investors hold those put options until expiration. They don't ever close them around. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the way that these are positioned, and obviously we don't know exactly the hedging close around it, but just conceptually, if you think about this, if Ray Dalio obviously owns a bunch of puts, then there are dealers, right? Banks that are short those put options and they have to hedge themselves out. And the way they would do that is by selling futures. Right. So yeah. as the market goes down, as you can see, the market goes down, they need to keep selling futures to, to remain hedged, obviously. Gotcha. And so the bigger those flows are, right, the more the more uh, futures that have to get sold, the more hedges would have to be put in place, you know, to 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 ma maintain or manage risk. Gotcha. Super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And so, you know, if you if you think about this and, and we talk about this with this for a second with Imran, is that the low in the March market with all the things that were going on, there was, you know, energy uh, issues with solvency in the energy markets, obviously the uh, coronavirus, all those different things. And the, the low in the market was the Monday after options expiration in, uh, in March. Now, uh, uh, Imran, excuse me, pointed out that there was some bad news that came out and, you know, on that Monday after, and he said, maybe that's the cash. But I said, look, all these put options are gone. So those flows that would hedge the market or need to hedge if the market goes down, right? As the market goes lower, that's the function of the negative gamma in the market. As the market goes down, dealers need to keep shorting to maintain their hedges. Suddenly those flows are all gone, right? Those puts are gone and that, that hedging flow that need to sell as the market goes lower, arguably gets removed, right? And we'll see what happens oftentimes is that people will search for a news item, right? To, to describe what's going on with the market. Mnuchin made a phone call or this headline came out or whatever it may be. I mean. I would point a famous example of this is when Tesla went to, you know, just recently Tesla went to $1,200, right? And and people said it was because of the Hertz news. I mean, as a, you know, the macro side better than I do. I don't think that Hertz deal is worth, I forget how exactly how much was added to the Tesla market cap. Market cap. <laughs> yeah. Not, obviously the, the, the Hertz deal was not, the Hertz deal may be cited as the reason why, right? But there was tens to hundreds of thousands of new call options being purchased in Tesla around that event. And that means that in that case, more call options being purchased means dealers need to buy Tesla, right? And that momentum, that gamma squeeze fires the thing up and we get a whatever it is, 10, 20% rally in Tesla stock. So the Tesla rally is the same thing as the S&P imploding in these things where once all those options expire, those flow goes away and, and we get essentially just mean reversion, right? That's, that's basically yeah. what these events were. Quick question. So it seems like this concept of a gamma squeeze works in both directions. Is that that fair to say? That's right. So um, the old school way of talking about this was we would call it a gamma trap. And, and, and we used to really watch mainly the put side of the equation. And this is, you know, back in 2018 and 2019, wherein you would typically get a lot of put options coming in the market. And that creates what we call a trap because when I buy put options and say I'm buying put options from you, Darius, and you're the dealer, you need to hedge yourself, as I said before. So I buy puts, you're short puts, and the way that you would hedge yourself is by selling futures or selling stock, right? So that flow, if it's big enough, is gonna push the market down when you short. So you're gonna start shorting, and maybe another trader goes, uh-oh, the market's going down here, I'm getting nervous, I'm gonna buy some hedge protection, I need to buy some hedge protection. So that incites that weaker market leads other people to buy more puts, right? So that leaves you, the market maker, short more puts, and you need to sell even more. It becomes this feedback loop, obviously. And then if you're familiar with how options work, as the market goes down, implied volatility goes up, right? The VIX rises when the market goes down. And if implied volatility goes up, that means that put options gain in value. So 
even if no one else purchases put options, the fact that implied vol spikes means that you as the dealer need to hedge even more, right? Because suddenly you were holding a put that was, let's say, worth two bucks. If implied volatility spikes, that puts now worth three dollars and you go, oh, man, I got to hedge some more. So you'll sell more futures or more stock. So it becomes this feedback loop. Implied vol goes higher. People get worried. They buy more puts and you just need to keep selling to keep yourself hedged, right, as a, as a dealer. Super. So that's kind of the trap that becomes this feedback loop. And then all of a sudden, options expiration hits, all the puts are gone, right? This is brilliant. So, Thank you for explaining that. I've, I've, I've had my thoughts on how that process worked, but you'd certainly clarified a lot of uh, what I thought the biggie. Yeah, and, I, and, and that, I think, kind of feeds back into why I think the options expiration is so important, because those flows, that feedback loop, essentially, just it just it breaks, right? It's, it's like the slate's wiped clean all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and, and, those, and those flows can change. And... So, you know, talking about the gamma squeeze in particular, the gamma squeeze is something that really manifested in like Tesla, uh, I would say in uh, like 2019, basically, you could see that stuff start to happen uh, where people would, I mean, people love Tesla. It's a crazy thing. They're just, they're just like maniacs, right? And, and good for them. They all buy calls and you could see those squeezes happen. That's the original kind of gamma squeeze. And then you had the, uh, the soft bank, right? In August of 2020, there was, yeah. A lot of tech names, you know, August of 2020 was up like 10 percent. And everyone's trying to figure out, you know, did SoftBank cause these gamma squeezes by buying these call options? Right. And in August at a 10 percent up month. Mm -hmm. Remember, there was the Tesla Apple split. Right. Yep. Big expiration there because there's a ton of people in Tesla calls and Apple calls trying to get the split because people think that the split means they're going to make some money. Um, all those options expire. And then that all that gain was gone. And I think it was about seven days. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So I guess I should tie it back again. I'm sorry, you asked about call, like the game is squeeze. So the call game is squeeze is the same thing in reverse, right? If I, if I start buying calls, well, there's your short calls as the dealer. You got to buy stock to hedge. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating about that now is we had such call demand that the implied volatility in these single stocks would, would jump. So just like implied volatility or the VIX spikes when the market sells off, the Tesla implied volatility, like if you created a Tesla VIX, the Tesla VIX would spike because there was such demand to buy calls that it would drive mm -hmm. up the price of options. The Tesla, GameStop, all those stocks were crashing up, essentially. It creates mm -hmm. the same feedback loop when you buy a ton of calls as it does when you buy a ton of puts. It's so interesting. Those things trade. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in sort of quantifying the relationship between volatility and price for a lot of the signals that we sort of feed into our, our, our market regime mm -hmm. outcasting process. And we find that things that are pot that tend to be positively correlated um, to their volatility. So their realized fall have that similar dynamic where, you know, they rise, they gap higher on higher realized fall. Interest rates have this uh, volatility indices have this, you know, meme stocks have this and, and cryptocurrencies have this. And mm -hmm. I think uh, as an investor, you sort of do well to understand when you're trading those types of assets that that, it, that exists. Because otherwise, if yeah. you use volatility as an indicator, you're otherwise you're going to otherwise get the wrong signal. Yeah, I, I, that, that's it's really uh, I think quite a unique view there to to look at that volatility and incorporate it into models in the way that you do. And it is the, the thing that I like so much about watching implied volatility is that implied volatility is essentially a view into the demand and supply of options. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is options market makers inventory? That is essentially what the implied vol is telling you. And so if implied volatility is spiking, that's telling you that that dealers are getting full, filled up on positions essentially, right? Because what implied volatility is, is if you raise the price of options, that means that the, you know obviously implied volatility is gonna go up. And so options market makers can control the implied volatility and adjust their price. So if everyone's buying Tesla call options, implied volatility is gonna go up because that demand is there, right? Obviously, if you want to stop the sit, if, if you want to prevent people from buying something, you raise the price of it, right? So if I wanted to deter if my inventory is getting too full, I'm going to raise the price of the options. Hopefully, that means people will back off of buying calls and they'll turn to selling them. So, yeah. kind of in that way, you know, and that's what I think is so fascinating about options. We were talking about like how sophisticated Citadel is, right? Um, that to to try to front run or force them out of a position or something like that, obviously it's, it's a losing game. They have more information than you, uh, as well as a lot of other sophisticated funds, right? But what's cool about the options market is 
there's enough information that we can figure out how they are positioned in, in, in a way kind of right along with them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and understand which way their flow is going to change. I know their flow will change on OPEX, or I believe that, right? And so that's where I think I can get some edge because I know that they're just want to hedge their book. They want to collect spread, right? Yeah. Um, and once their options position changes, well, then maybe I know that their flow is going to change. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we sort of stepped forward a little bit. We talked, you know, you brought the idea that, that quarterly expirations uh, or, or larger expirations are obviously more impactful or meaningful. So I highlighted some of the quarterly expirations from, uh, from this past year. There isn't a, a big expiration typically every third Friday of every month. Um, and on a name by name basis, it could matter for different stocks. What we've really seen happen over this past year is that the demand for very short term options has gone through the roof. So typically it would be the third Friday every month, which captures most of the options flow that third Friday expiration. Now in the, in the sort of most popular stocks, it's whatever the next Friday expiration is. So those are, that is where most flow is concentrated on. Um, you'll hear some very sophisticated options. People talk about, you know, jump risks now in markets being higher. And that's the idea that, that volatility will go from being fairly flat to all of a sudden very high. And I think that would really characterize this last year where you would see that a stock could be kind of just hanging out and all of a sudden just launch right five or 10% and you go, what's going on? And people, oh, the Wall Street Reddit, that's people are buying options or whatever it be. And when you use those short-term options, people like them because they cost the less in terms of the, they cost the least amount in terms of premium. Obviously, if you're buying an option, it's only a couple of days out. It's like, you know, maybe a dollar or $2 and anyone can play in that sandbox, so to speak, right? But those have the most impact from a gamma perspective, from a dealer hedging perspective, right? Because they expire in just a few days. And so when big options positions change that are just a few days out, that can really change the way that dealers need to hedge, right? They really need to focus on making sure that they don't have that, that risk of all these guys piling into the options that expire in five days. Whereas like if I buy options that are six months out, I have a little more time to figure out how I may want to adjust my, uh, my hedges to that position, right? Gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. Um, so those quarterly, so the, the, on a single stock basis, you know, five days out can matter as an expiration, but in general, the quarterly expirations in the S and P are the biggest. And I think you guys being macro focused in terms of the S and P and the, and the NASDAQ, um, positions, the quarterlies matter the most. And again, you can see that, you know, there are significant lows oftentimes around these quarterly expirations. Not only that, you can often see price drive down into these expirations and, if you understand gamma, basically what that's telling you is that the hedging sensitivity increases of an option as you get closer to options expiration. So that can often be why you'll see volatility drive down into the event and then sort of spring back after um, uh, after the actual expiration itself. You and I also were talking earlier that the from a macro perspective, the day to day you know, movement of a lot of these positions may not matter, right? But if you know that your model suggesting that you should add to your equity exposure to reduce your equity exposure, I think these quarterly expirations, you know, are an interesting time, right? The, the calendar uh, timing of that is interesting for when you may want to allocate, you know, around these events. And I mean, most, most folks watching this will attest to this. I got fleeced by OPEX, I mean, at least three times last spring, summer. I mean, certainly I can see it on the chart in May. Could see it on the chart in June, got to see it on the chart in July, and I could see it on the chart in August. And after August, I was like, there seems to be a recurring pattern here in terms of my trading out of things <laughs> <laughs> on the lows of OPEX. Let me just take a step back and stop doing this. Uh, so, yeah, no, it definitely it has it, it has impact. Um, and certainly, you know, at least over the last couple of those um, iterations, you know, we did have a negative market regime or market regime that would suggest more volatility, sort of bigger drawdown risk, higher correlation risk. Um, both within the equity and credit markets and across asset classes. So, you know, we were making thoughtful, what we thought were thoughtful sales at that time. And, and certainly the signals were sort of telling us to do so. But um, in retrospect, you know, we could have uh, avoided a lot of that pain if we had a better understanding of some of these dynamics. So we're very glad that you're on here now today, my man. <laughs> well, well, thank you. And I, and I think that, um, I mean, this, this exploration that we're going to move into now, you know, is I would like a bunch of your advice here because we have a pretty interesting expiration set up. So I, I think the predominant flow that we've seen in markets and by all means, correct me if I'm wrong here, but basically the higher interest rates are leading to sell off in tech and other interest rate sensitive stocks mm -hmm. and energy's doing okay. I think financials were doing okay. I haven't checked honestly in the last day or two to see how they're doing, but 
there's been essentially just a rotation and flow from my perspective that has kept the S and P relatively buoyant compared to like the Nasdaq, right? And, and yeah. IWM's getting really uh, beaten up pretty badly as well. So um, what's fascinating to me about that and and why I'm interested interested in your feedback is we have very big options deltas expiring uh, on this Friday. And mm -hmm. what what that essentially means is there's a lot of deep in the money options. So if you think about a call option that is say, uh, so let's just talk about Tesla, for example. Tesla is currently around $1,000 per share and it has somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to $30 billion in deltas expiring uh, on Friday. So what that means is there's a bunch of deep in the money call options. If you go to your brokerage platform and look at the open interest for January, you'll see there's tens of thousands of calls at say the 600 strike at the 300 strike at the 750 mm -hmm. strike, all of these strikes that are well below where the stock is trading. So those are, those options have a high amount of Delta. What's that's basically telling us is that they trade those options trade equivalent to shares of stock. Mm -hmm. So if I have one call option that, uh, you know, I bought last year for $25,000 when Tesla was at say $500 a share, that option is now worth somewhere around hundred thousand dollars, right? Because mm -hmm. it's worth a hundred shares of stock. So those deltas are going to expire on Friday. Now, there's a myriad of different ways, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds around which way this, these things could be positioned and how the hedging flows will shift around that. But basically, from an investor standpoint, I view that these big options deltas, and I'll show some names that are, are set to expire here, could cause volatility in the stock. Yeah. A breakout of a shift away from 1,000 for Tesla, you know, my personal feeling is I think that this could lead to some selling flows or is pressuring some of these stocks a little bit lower. But essentially what we're saying is that this is an event or a catalyst for volatility. Now on the chart here is the Delta notional of calls. So how much call Delta there is. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, the lighter blue here, the teal color is the put Delta. So this is what we would view as the most extreme possible position. So last week, this was about a net of one point, uh, call it basically, $100 billion notional was the net delta difference there, right? Wow. Um, and again, that's the, and, that, and this is this is across many different stocks. Now, Tesla is a huge part of this, but I'll show you a breakdown of how I look at it here in a, in a, in a second. Uh, and again, the idea here is that some calls could be held long by investors. Some calls could be held short. Dealers have longer dated calls that might be offsetting some of this exposure. So I'm not here trying to say that this is a March of 2020 type event. But if I was interested in watching a bunch of these major uh, equities in the way that they're positioned, um, this is something that I'd be watching for, right? Now, how those, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Say it, it strikes me, and maybe I'm, I'm front running your presentation and, and, and slap me on the wrist if I am, but it seems like once these, the, the big blue lines, the big blue bars expire, that the dealers no longer have to be long the underlying and they can sort of dump the underlying on the market. That, that's the that's sort of like if you wanted your Armageddon sort of scenario, that's what you would say, right? Now, the, the these flows can change fairly rapidly based on several things, right? If these tech stocks sell off, as they sort of have been coming down over the last couple of days, that actually drops the amount of delta exposure, right? And if you think about it, it makes sense because if you have a deep in the money call at 600, right, and the stock Tesla stock goes from a 1,000 down to 900, well, you just lost a bunch of value, right? So, so the delta line here would, would decrease. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, there's some path dependency, I guess, that, but, but I think if you were sort of looking at the, the worst case scenario, you go, yes, Darius, I totally agree with you that all these big uh, call, deep in the money calls are expiring. Any hedges that were long delta trades to offset dealer short positions would essentially go away, right? Um, and so we just sort of updated this slide for today. And what you can see is that what's interesting is the, the call side seems to be, oh, I actually put the same slide up there. <laughs> I, I'll, I have a picture of the slide, I duplicated the slide. So what we actually saw today, I apologize for this everybody, is that the 118 slide, the, the put deltas are increasing a little bit. So mm -hmm. this uh, 115 number, or excuse me, 1.5, 150 billion number is now down a little bit more towards 100 billion and the put deltas have increased. So that the amount of delta from last Friday, the 14th to today has actually shrunk uh, a decent amount. I think that is a function of stocks being weaker, right? And, and, and prices coming down. Quick quick question, uh, just sort of mechanically, are the, is this sort of adjusted for kind of the, the, the distance from last price, or if you will, like the, 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 the implied strike or the moneyness of the option, I guess? Like could the puts yeah. be sort of struck much lower than the calls are struck higher? Um, 
Yeah. So for the, as we get sort of closer to expiration, obviously um, the, so most of those calls are in the money because, and, yeah. and I think the, the reason they're in the money is because, and the reason January is such a big expiration is because anyone that buys a leap, right. Or wants to purchase a far dated option, typically January is the only expiration you can buy. Like if you look up now and, and want to purchase some long dated leverage, right. Which is what basically these, these leap calls are, you know, you can pick like January of next year and maybe March of next year. So yeah. the concentration of positions, um, this is a function of the fact that the January option positions have been around for a long time. Gotcha. I think they can be used to hedge convertible debt in some cases or whatever it may be. It's a, it's a stock by stock basis, but kind of the most famous leap buyer of that there is, is Nancy Pelosi. So if you look at all the options that she buys, she buys leaps, right? She'll look at like five, not, sorry, her financial advisor will <laughs> lead them to buy leaps. And <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the day before some laws, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the, so she'll, she'll buy or her financial advisor or husband or whatever will buy, you know, a couple of different tech stocks. Roblox was the recent one or Google or whatever it may be. And they'll buy, you know, a year out. Right. And and they'll hold them to expiration and, and they like that trade. They'll typically buy kind of at the money or slightly in the money options because they get that leverage. Right. Mm -hmm. Rather than buying 100 shares of Roblox, I'll take. Uh, you know, let's say I was going to buy hundred shares of Roblox and I'm willing to take a 5% loss on that. Well, why not just take the 5%, the capital equivalent to 5% loss, buy a bunch of call options and let them ride. And I'll buy five different names. If one of them doubles, I've more than made, you know, uh, you know, you can just do the math on that, right? I'm more than yeah. made. So I, and she, that's just one example. I'm sure other private wealth People, I'm sure she's not unique in the way that she does those trades. There could be macro funds looking for exposure. I mean, there's a, a myriad of different reasons of why you want to own some of those longer dated call options. And so that is why there's such a concentration um, of, of notional values here. It's because people buy these long dated calls and the market has been on a tear, right? I mean, not in the last week or two, but Mark from last year, you know, the S&P is up what, over 20%, right? Yeah. Uh, certainly Tesla and the like are up. And what's interesting too is, you know, we have a, if you go to spotgammon.com and click on blog, we have an article that, that shows some of these charts and, and gives our, 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 another rundown of this. But basically the notional value here is the same notional value uh, that was tied to last year. It was around a hundred billion notional, depending on exactly the day that you looked at it. And so we went back and we tied the tie out and tried to say, okay, can we see how these individual stock flows, you know, may have impacted the market last year? Well, you know, this is the, the one year anniversary of the GameStop saga, right? I think, you know, Melvin Capital basically goes <laughs> belly up in a couple of days from now. And this is the week that Robin Hood kind of blew up and all this sort of stuff. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's very hard to figure out or isolate what the OPEX flows may have been. And I, I could even make an argument, maybe that OPEX flows exacerbated all that volatility that took place last year, right? I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it's hard to tell me I'm wrong on that, just as it's hard to, for me to prove I'm right. But, you know, these, there's always these synchronicities between big options expirations and, and things just going weird. Right. So um, if you're going to look and, and the way that I broke this down, if you're going to look at sort of some of the names, individual names, just to get an idea here, what I did here is I took the Delta notional and I turned that into the number of shares that you would have to buy to hedge out the Delta that's expiring on Friday. And then I took those shares. So, you know, I, I basically transferred, uh, translated the Delta notional to stock uh, shares of stock. And then I compare that to the average daily volume. And I just use Google finance for this data, but basically so what you can see here is that in, for example, Expedia, there's the equivalent of 400% of ADV expiring in Delta notional terms on tied to this Friday's expiration. Now, exactly how this may or may not affect the stock is based on how people are positioned and these kinds of things. But if I'm a big investor in Expedia or any of the names you see here, and we have a more comprehensive list available too, you can see how these flows might matter. Obviously, Tesla is the one that would catch everybody's eye here. It's $30 billion of flow. So, you know, Elon, I think, sold, I think, 10 billion total, something like that, 10, 15 billion total over those couple of weeks. And obviously, there's a, a more of a macro signal when he's selling his shares of stock, but essentially, that was the amount of flow that, that he was trading out of. And so, how much Delta's expired for Tesla is going to be a function of the stock's price over the next couple of days and if people close positions early. Uh, but, you know, I would say that this is a catalyst for some type of volatility in Tesla and, you know, how you want to position around that. Quick question. You, you, uh, you said something that caught my attention. 
close positions early. Could could that be some of sort of what we're experiencing like thus far this week over the last you know week or so? As investors yeah, are I mean, these positions uh-huh, early uh-huh. and getting ahead of it? A hundred percent. I don't you know, I think the the biggest funds will hold to expiration. And and this gotcha. is sort of what the conversation is, right? There, there is certainly a school of thought that says that that this impact, this expiration may not matter because essentially, if you believe that, let's say that all Tesla call holders are long calls, right? And, and dealers are hedged strictly with long shares of stock, right? Because if you're the dealer, you're short those calls. I'm rent, I'm super trader, I'm long all these calls, I'm making a ton of money. So your short calls versus long stock is your hedge. On expiration, we can let these things expire. And when they settle, you will have your your long shares taken away and I will be assigned the long shares of Tesla stock, right? So in that case, you wouldn't have to sell anything because look, it's all the expiration to care of it. The, the assignment around the settlement means that that the flows are, are moved because the obviously the contract settlement would mean that your long shares get delivered to me and now you're flat. I don't think that most, you know, if you think about the gap between what those calls, what you invested in those calls, say twenty five or thirty thousand dollars last year, now the call is worth a hundred thousand dollars. You know, do you want to take down all that Tesla stock? Are you going to want to hold that much Tesla stock in the next week if you believe that it's all just going to be, you know, settled? If this is a long macro fund, you know, their call exposure or their exposure to Tesla has gone up significantly. Would they want to reallocate out of that next week, right? So there's so many just variables at play here and how these might settle. If someone closes today, that would drop the notional exposure, obviously, and you mm-hmm. may see may see some intraday impact based on, um, you know, the hedge, hedges sort of rolling off in and around that. Uh, but I think what the what what the point is is that, and you bring up a good one, is that these things could close now, anytime between now and Friday, obviously, and the hedging flows might not settle out until Monday or Tuesday. You just you really don't know. So mm-hmm. what we've been talking about or advising people is like, I'm not going to try to front run or get in front of these options flows. But I can tell you that if, you know, Apple, and Amazon, Tesla are down sharply on Monday and Tuesday, that I'm going to believe that options flows are a major catalyst or a major reason for that. So I would love to see these stocks get pounded on Monday and Tuesday because I would believe wholeheartedly that the options flows are what's driving those lower. And then that would mean that I think I have some edge there and understanding the flow that's going on. And it's not a Hertz headline or something else. It's options expiration. So so, you know, let me look at getting in, into some of these positions, right? Uh, yeah, that's exactly how I would think about it. <clears throat> think about it as well. Yeah. And and so um, the other thing from options expiration, and I, I've been, you know, uh, chatting away here. I get, once I get going, I have a hard time stopping. So <laughs> but, <laughs> we don't mind, man. This is great. You're so, um, the so yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you don't mind. So I want to switch topics slightly because I think these, these, uh, the time frames are interesting. We have the FOMC next week, mm-hmm. and um, we were talking before about implied volatility. And so there's this concept of Vanna that people probably hear coming up all the time. And and basically what Vanna is 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 it measures the change in delta for a change in implied volatility. So I'll say that another way, some more simpler way. Um, at the most basic level, if the VIX goes down, that's telling you that options S and P options are losing value, specifically put options. Uh, or particularly put options, let's just say. And since mm-hmm. those put options are losing value, market makers and dealers could buy back short hedges. Yeah. So as vol goes down, the dealer's exposure, their their short exposure decreases, right? So if my short exposure decreases, then I can buy back some of my short futures. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah. Definitely. And if vol spikes, if the VIX goes up, that means that put options are increasing in value, which means dealers' exposure is getting more short. So they need to hedge more, right? They got to sell more futures. So basically, VIX up means dealers need to sell features. VIX down means dealers need to buy features. That's the Vanna trade, basically. Gotcha, so gotcha. in this case, if you watch VIX push higher and we're, you know, today was VIX expiration and it kind of seems like the VIX is becoming a little bit unpinned here. Obviously, I don't know what's going on in the market in the last hour here, but the VIX seems like it's kind of unpinned. You see the market's down. That VIX unpinning says, implied vol is going up. we got to sell more features to, to stay hedged. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that the VIX complex can settle down until FOMC. So yeah. I would I would turn to you and say, I don't have a good understanding of what the market is expecting here, but I would say that the tech stocks are particularly weak. If we get a lot of volatility, OPEX and Duke's volatility into Monday and Tuesday, we could have a pretty strong drawdown. I don't know if it will happen, but if it does, that plays in FOMC where we had this FOMC 
uh, upsets the market or, or volatility is pinning or at least holding because they want to know what Powell's going to say. We had single stocks that could get sold off pretty hard based on this OPEX. Could create a pretty interesting timing by the dip timing. Again, I don't know what your expectations are. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think about the? Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, it kind of goes back to the November jobs report, you know, in the last, in December jobs report really just built on that in terms of, you know, kind of really marking us forward in time in terms of how much the Fed has to tighten in 2022. Um, if you kind of look at kind of the progression of everything, we saw, you know, kind of a step function increase in, in, in the rate of improvement in some of the more uh, kind of, you know, off the beaten path metrics within the labor market. If you look at uh, unemployment rates for folks without a high school degree or folks with a high, with just a high school degree or the unemployment rate for Hispanics and African-Americans, those metrics really materially improved in November and then again in December. And then you saw the big step function increase in, 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 in wages um, in the month of December, you know, particularly looking at average weekly earnings um, that in our opinion, it was a function of the lack of improvement um, in the prime working age labor force participation rate. So, you know, that's kind of a long winded way of saying, hey, since the last time we heard from the Fed, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot more information or not the last time we heard from them because we obviously had Powell and, and Brainerd's testimony alongside of other Fed speak last week. But in terms of their last policy update, it's not necessarily clear to us that they've they, that the, their guidance, their sort of forward guidance has really kind of uh, incorporated a lot of these sort of additional changes we've seen in the labor market. So, um, you know, I kind of tweeted out this morning, we're kind of getting towards peak gamma from the perspective of the rate of change of policy tightening expectations. You know, in the last month, we've effectively gone from maybe getting a hike in March to definitely getting a hike in March, quantitative tightening. And oh, by the way, that hike in March might actually be 50 basis points instead of 25. I happen to think it's probably likely to be 25, but maybe it is 50 in, in terms of taking us off with the bang and, and kind of giving themselves some air cover on this, the political dynamic around inflation. So, um, you know, it's very likely that what we hear from them next Wednesday will be incrementally more hawkish than what we heard from them on December 15th and potentially kind of right in line or slightly more hawkish than what we heard from them over the previous two weeks. And, and in our opinion, that is probably going to be the peak in terms of the speed of the market's repricing of the tightness of, of the tighter policy, because from this point forward, you know, you're really left with is, is, is a growth curve uh, that should be sort of peaking, uh, making a lower high and, and rolling over. And more importantly, the inflation curve that should be start to come up, start to come under pressure as we progress kind of into the, the second second quarter of this year. So it sounds like there's a fair amount of uncertainty around, I guess, policies on Wednesday. It's not like I think a lot of times the Fed people go, I know what they're going to say. It's not really, you know, it's not. We'll we'll typically impl imply volatility up into those events, but that's just sort of a natural making sure that you know Powell doesn't say something truly out of out of out of bounds, right? Uh, but it sounds like the out of bounds range here is a lot higher. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I think if they give any credence to the market's expectation or growing expectation of a 50 basis point hike, that would, in our opinion, would be kind of out of it in terms of like the widest, you know, that, that'll be like the farthest right tail or left tail from the perspective of mm -hmm. asset markets uh, in terms of what they can do. Um, and if that's it, in our opinion, that's kind of it for a surprise. You know, everything else they're likely to do from a policy perspective going forward from that point is likely to be well within the kind of the middle of the distribution. And so from that perspective, I think, you know, you're starting to get to a place where bonds are starting to become attractive duration, particularly kind of quality duration, high free cash mm -hmm. flow uh, yield type stocks in the equity market are going to start to become uh, more attractive to buyers as well. But as you mentioned, we just have to get through these options market dynamics in order to give us a better price. And so I don't mean to put you on the spot with this question, but I think it ties into the fact that tech stocks in particular, you know, seem to be in line to get hit pretty hard here. I mean, how much farther does just say the NASDAQ in general have to go before you say, okay, from a, from a macro perspective, yes, we're going to get some rate hikes, but it's gone a little bit too far. Yeah. I mean, so that, that's kind of a, uh, that's a question to be answered two ways. One within the context of our probable range. I mean, I would imagine the NASDAQ's oversold. I haven't refreshed the model uh, while we're speaking, but based on today's intraday rehearsal, it's probably oversold here in, 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 based on our entire discussion on the options market dynamics and not trying to front run that. I would not be buying the dip into, you know, kind of next Monday, Tuesday, and potentially next Wednesday. I think you have to be smart about kind of respecting the fact that there are bigger forces in the market, obviously, as we're, we're discussing that, that, you know, will override any sort of, you know, kind of a problem range process or things of that nature. Um, in terms of where, you know, when it gets to be too much, I mean, there's kind of the, there's kind of the, the, the more 
the more obvious uh, trade, which is, hey, does the index actually turn bearish, you know, from the perspective of the, our volatility adjusted momentum signal? Uh, not there yet, but to the extent it does turn bearish, that's when your kind of antenna are up. And more importantly, it does it turn bearish in the context of other broader signals um, that are actually confirming a, a, a more you know, kind of risk off move in asset markets. Right now, you know, you look at global macro, you kind of take a step back from the US equity market, as we always should do. Global macro, we're, we're still very much in a reflation regime. It's a very weak reflation regime, but we're still in a reflation regime and the sector rotation underneath is something you highlighted earlier is building. It's actually building in the direction of reflation. So I have a decent amount of confidence that whatever weakness we see between now and let's call it next Wednesday is a dip to be bought. I just, I, I'm losing confidence in terms of the ultimate kind of sustainability of that dip because as we get closer and closer in time in terms of pushing through 2022, we're running out of time to price in a positive response to reflation, a positive response to Omicron potentially ending the pandemic. We're compressing that amount of time because once you get into the QT time frame, all bets are off. I, I listened to your uh, Macro Voices podcast, by the way. That was great. I got a uh, notebook full of stuff that I got to study there. No, um, thank you, man. I appreciate you. So, so it, I, you brought one thing that caught sort of my, my ear was that the idea that the S&P hasn't really responded in the same way that, that the tech space has. And, and we were kind of catching that. And you also mentioned that you know, macro flows are really going to drive certainly options positioning in a lot of ways. And so one of the things that we were talking about recently in our sort of notes were that the fact that implied volatility in the S&P really hadn't spiked, even though there's so much selling. And, and again, some of that could be sector rotation. But the big concern for us was that if implied volatility did spike, if the VIX, if the VIX does start to spike, then you're going to start S&P selling at a time when everything else is pretty weak, right? There's not, you know, uh, things are... Uh, are um, fragile, so to speak, in general. So you're going to raise the VIX, get this dealer selling, induce put buying, and that could really add to kind of the mess here is, is kind of what one of our concerns are. Is like the S&P options market didn't really seem to wake up yet, basically. Well, this is, that's been freaking me out as well. I mean, normally you see like in these in these corrections, you know, the VIX gets backwardated, you know, the, the VIX spikes to 30, you right. know, let's call it 30, big round number. And we just haven't seen that. And, you know, yeah. so the fact that we haven't seen that means one of two things. One, this decline was going to be really contained, which obviously if, if today is any indication, it's probably not. So I guess next stop, VIX 30 is probably where this all ends in terms of this uh, shorter term weakness that we're seeing. Yeah, and I, I think oftentimes, too, you mentioned the backwardation. I mean, we like to see that because it's just like, OK, that means stuff's gotten finally flushed out, right? Just yeah. like the options expiration is like flush these positions out we feel much more confident that this is over. The extremes are either in sentiment in terms of backwardation or uh, in positioning, you know, puts get wiped out. That's all, that's, that's kind of a nice signal for us to say, okay, some of those flows that were leading to weakness have hit extremes and now, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there's some bottoming in here, but. And you um, can, let's, let's play the calendar catalyst forward too, right? Like, let's say we wipe, let's, we get VIX 30 by next Wednesday at some point, you know, s and down another three, 4% from here. And then from that point forward, you know, the expectations curve on policy tightening just start to dissipate in terms of that spread between spot price and, you know, future expectations. Mm. Uh-oh, I think we may have lost Darius there. Okay. Just Delta, but more importantly, you know, it might actually have a bigger positive impact uh, in terms of the right tail on growth. And then you get further into the teeth earnings season where some of the higher quality companies might start to report, you know, particularly in the tech side of things. And, you know, so you could say, hey, look, all the weakness that we're experiencing in January could be more than undone uh, in terms of February. And this goes back to my discussion I had with uh, Jim Carson on Real Vision at the beginning of the year, which is we're going to get a lot of these leptocritic, I keep mispronouncing that word, leptocritic dynamics to begin the year, which is big down move, big up move, maybe get a bigger down move after that. And that's certainly something we're uh, expecting in terms of that progression. That, that it's it's fascinating. I mean, there's there there are several catalysts here in the next week, so um, it's it's really going to be quite mm -hmm. interesting to watch and see. And uh, you know, again, I don't think the I don't think that the vol or VIX will get materially sold for my small seed until at least Powell. Powell might spike it further, but I don't think we're gonna get, we're gonna get a volatility selling. In other words, people are gonna keep their hedges on now. They're hedging Powell. Most yeah. Macro guys certainly don't care about options expiration the way that I do, and totally. so you know, 
maybe Wednesday is the first we'll start to see put selling, which will drive ball down. And then we get what's called the banner rally where the supply ball gets sold off and people can cover, uh, cover their shorts basically. Absolutely. Sounds like we're setting up for uh, selling March and go away maybe. All right. Uh, do you mind if we get to some questions before we wrap up? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. So uh, we'll try to do a little uh, rapid fire, just make sure everyone gets to get some, feel some love. Starting with our friend, Steve Beamer. What's up, Steve? Uh, how do you judge the size of the opportunity for the rip? Is there anything kind of in your analysis that says, hey, like, this is a better buying opportunity than, say, you know, another one? Yeah, so uh, that's a it's a great question. One of the things that we measure is is the essentially the positioning in the S&P 500. And so we have this idea of of a call wall, we'll typically call it. But basically what you're trying to figure out is where are most calls positioned and where are most puts positioned. <clears throat> and in between there, so I, I want to show uh, this chart here. So in between here, this is a this is a basically calls are, are positioned on the top here and puts are positioned on the bottom. And so where you see large options positions laid out, the strikes which have large options positions will often determine where the market will, you, what, what the market will use as support resistance. So the easy, the easy rally in this case would be to 4,700. That could happen very quickly. And at 4,700, even though these bars look smaller, they're measuring gamma. So if S&P rallies at 4,700, you would see you know, these bars would grow quite substantially. But basically what we have here is put dominated markets in and around this area. As we go over 4,650, we sort of transition to more, more call positioning, and that would allowed to an easy rally up into the 4700 area basically um, and as call positions build up and this is kind of too in depth i guess for what we're talking about here but as call positions build up we think that market makers flow compresses volatility it, this is called the big positive gamma market if you ever heard that term so when you have a negative gamma market that means mostly puts in the market we get a lot of volatility and then when we get a lot of calls position in the s p that's called the positive gamma market and that the hedging flows around positive gamma means that volatility compresses and the trading range is coming. So Excellent. I hope that answers your question, but basically I think a rally to 4,700 would be quite easy. Yeah, absolutely. That's super, yeah, super helpful. Uh, Rich, uh, what's up, Rich? Uh, Rich Law is asking, uh, can you, you explain Vanna, but can you also explain uh, Charm as well? That's another one. Sure, sure. So Charm is the change in delta related to time decay. So um, essentially every day you move towards expiration, options lose value. And based on that loss of value, you can assign a hedging flow that might might come from that. So let's just say, for example, Darius bought a put that expires on Friday. Every day, assuming the market doesn't move at all, every day that put loses a little bit of value, right? So if I had to hedge Darius's put with 100 short shares of spiders today, tomorrow when his put loses, say, you know, 25% of his value, it's very dirty math. I can sell, I can buy back 25 of my shares of spiders, right? So the charm flow would be those 25 shares of spiders. The next day, Darius's put drops to 50 cents. I can then buy back another 25 shares of, of my short, right? So that, if you if you look at those flows, right? If you say there's huge options expi expiring on Friday and there's a lot of at the money puts in particular, right? Um, as those puts expire, I can, I, my short exposure, right? My, my range of possibilities is decreasing as, a, as someone who's short puts. Okay, market's probably not going on 10% now. I can buy a little bit more back, right? Mark's probably not going down five percent now because expiration is tomorrow. Right? I can I can buy my futures back. So th that that's the charm. Flow. Super helpful. Thank you. Um, you can, I think it's implied by this chart that I'm looking at the absolute gamma levels. But uh, Thomas Bonner is asking um, how firm is the floor right beneath us? Say at forty five twenty. Uh, obviously, it's a big strike. Uh, a lot of gamma at forty five hundred. Yeah, forty five hundred is a pretty big strike. I mean, we would need real heavy selling flow, a real increase in the VIX, a real signals that put buying is stepping in, in large ways to break through this 4500 level and if this if this 4500 line was only put options if, in other words if you didn't see this bar up here it was just purely puts then i would say that that wouldn't act as much as a as a floor but these call options are obviously deep in the money calls at this point or they were you know heading into this and so we think that the hedging flows will increase around this 4500 level and as they increase that kind of creates a sort of pinning effect that's really why it's a support line basically um gotcha. around into that area so that's why you know 4500 is a pretty big floor 4000 strike is a, is a massive floor not that we're set to get down that that low but you know uh, 4500 i think is, is a pretty reasonable uh estimate certainly for any short-term you know uh, volatility in, in this week 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Curbs asking, um, is it eyeball spike or, or do you have any other sort of options related kind of, kind of indicators that would give you a better it signal of whether or not to go risk off before OPEX for, for any given OPEX? Yeah, I, I think in general, just watching the VIX is, is the simplest way for most people. I mean, you know, what the VIX is supposed to show us is implied volatility of the S&P options complex. And, you know, like true options aficionados will tell you, you can't use the VIX as a measure of S&P implied volatility. But for our purposes here, it works great. And essentially, if you think about it, what the VIX is telling you, the VIX is going up. It's telling us that options are getting more expensive. And when options are getting more expensive, it's just a sign of demand, basically, right? So if the VIX is going up, you can, in a way, translate that to put buying is in demand. People want to buy put options. They want to buy protection, mm -hmm. right? And if the VIX is dropping or declining, that's telling me that people are closing out their puts, that they're selling off their protection. So, you you know, if you just watch the VIX as a function of that of that concept, right? If the VIX is going down, that's signaling to me that that people are selling put options and that implied volatility is coming down, which means that dealers again can start to buy stock. So, yeah. or buy futures back, right? Cover their shorts. So you can watch this. I mean, it was a fascinating thing to watch uh, just on Friday because there was the three day weekend, right? And a lot of people don't want to own puts over a three day weekend because of the time decay. And so if you remember, there's a pretty good rally on Friday into the close and you could see the VIX come down and you could see implied volatility was, was you know, that's the signal implied vol is dropping. We saw a lot of puts close in our data. Uh, on Friday, and that's because people want to avoid time decay to close out their puts, right? Because I don't want to pay, I don't want to pay that theta, right? I don't want to pay that time decay of holding over a three-day weekend. So I'm going to close these out now. And as the market rallies, it makes more people want to close puts because they're getting burnt, and, it, and it's sort of like mini feedback loop, right? Happened on Friday. All right, cool. Uh, la last, uh, last question. Uh, Namish is asking. What's up, Namish? Are you seeing? Uh, and maybe you don't uh, track this at all, but uh, are you seeing a similar type of gamma move in WTI? Is that potentially what could be happening? The, the, the crude sector is pretty interesting. I, I don't monitor the options, uh, the options complex in, <clears throat> um, in commodities. But what I can say is that there are oftentimes very big flows in the equity space around that. So uh, XLE was on this list. So there's a pretty good expiration in XLE, which is the energy ETF. And what you can, what you can do, which is interesting, is you can see the flows come into the sectors on a kind of a, an aggregate basis, right? So sectors get hot, people will pile into those. So things mm -hmm. like Exxon Mobil uh, and some of these smaller cap uh, oil energy names were getting bid up quite a bit. That, you know, obviously that's a signal that prices are going to get higher, but that, that starts to signal me that it's a little bit of a crowded trade oftentimes. Um, so earlier this month, I think it was uh, earlier this month, we saw a lot of flow heading into the financials. And I think that can overheat some of these names, right? It's kind of like a, a gamma squeeze in, in certain places. So um, to sort of answer your question, WTI itself, I don't have really much to offer you, but I can tell you that in energy itself, to get XLE, ExxonMobil, Chevron, those names are attracting some pretty big uh, call attention. Absolutely. Well, man, this has been excellent. Uh, we kept you for longer than we intended to, but uh, we appreciate uh, all your wonderful insights, man. You're 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 blessing to the community or certainly blessing to team 42. And we, uh, we thank you and, and everyone watching. I mean, look, I, I, I personally subscribe to this work. I subscribe to Imran's work as well. It's made me a smarter investor. I, I read it every day. I, it certainly helps me think about navigating some of these shorter term moves. You know, like I was talking to Brent earlier, like it's not going to necessarily determine whether or not we're going risk off or risk, you know, risk on, you know, we have our own broader signals and, and, and indicators to determine things like that, but whether or not you're sort of sending out a signal to buy the dip here or, or sell the rib here. I think those things, those times of signals will become increasingly more important in 2022 as, as we have more realized volatility, both in the stock market and across asset classes. So definitely go check them out at spot, spotgamma.com. You can follow them on Spot Gamma on Twitter as well. So appreciate y'all. Thanks, Darius. Appreciate the opportunity. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Thank you.